tonight about the, uh, the kingdom, I, I, what I'm going to do in this lesson, because there, there is a lot, I don't think we feel this as much, but there's a lot of confusion about the establishment of Christ's kingdom. Has it happened? Is it going to happen someday? What's the story on that? So rather than me try to argue a lot with uh, denominational concepts and different ideas people have, what I really wanted to do is take a very simple approach to the kingdom. I want to look at it, and I, I've chosen this to ask questions and then answer them forthrightly with Scripture in ways that I don't think you can misunderstand so that we track in our minds what God's purpose was, what Christ said would take place, and what actually happened in regard to the kingdom of God. So we'll look at this this evening. You might consider this a lesson on considering the kingdom, considering the passages that talk about that, and what, what do we know about them. And I'm going to start you, and there are actually several Old Testament passages, but there are some that specifically mention the concept of a kingdom, and I, I want to go to those in the book of Daniel. So I want to start by asking, and there's lots you could talk about about what I'm about to bring up, but we'll keep it pretty simple. What did God say he would set up? What, what was he going to do? He said he would set something up, so what is it? And we read about this in Daniel chapter 2, and you'll remember this section of Scripture, verse 34 and 35, but we'll not study it as intricately as, as we could on other occasions. He says this, as you look, and this was Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, Daniel's interpreting the dream. He said, as you looked, a stone was cut out by no, uh, that was not by human hand, by no human hand. It struck the image that represented the successive empires, including Nebuchadnezzar and future empires down to the days of Rome. It struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and it broke them in pieces. But that stone that struck the image, it became a great mountain and it filled the whole earth. Okay, that, that stone represents God's kingdom that he was going to establish and how it would usurp and, and take the place of all these other kingdoms. Now, it goes on to say at verse 44, as it lists the series of great empires and ends with that fourth empire where we would have, obviously, kings during that day. In the days of those kings, of that fourth empire, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. Now you want to think about that a moment. God's predicting there will be a time when these, the kingdom of God will come. It will come during the days of the kings of that fourth empire. Tonight's sake, we can't go into all of that. You've heard other lessons perhaps about that. The kingdom shall not be left to the other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. It shall stand forever. So God was going to establish his kingdom. He told a time period when that would take place. And the New Testament shows the fulfillment of that. I'm going to add another thought from the book of Daniel. Because he promised to give his son something that relates to the kingdom. Okay, let's look at that for a moment. This is in Daniel 7, and in that section of Scripture, verse 13 and 14, listen to this description. Now he said, I, I was watching, this would be Daniel talking about this, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man was coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, which is God, and they brought him near before him. So what's the picture? The picture is he's going with clouds, but he's going up to God, and he has brought before God. And then it says, to him was given, now listen to this description, given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion, is an everlasting dominion. So it's not, he's not ruler over one of the kingdoms of the earth. His dominion is an everlasting, age-long dominion, which shall not pass away. In his kingdom, I think this is interesting, he doesn't just say his kingdom will never be destroyed, he says it is the one that shall never be destroyed. Well, taking into consideration in chapter 2, he said God's going to establish a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, this pinpoints that we're talking about that same kingdom. 
His kingdom is the one that shall never be destroyed. So, we're not talking about a kingdom that will last a period of time, but is a forever kingdom. Alright? Now, we move from the Old Testament and start on the pages of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and talk about what they're talking about. And let's take on the earliest of that time period, and that's the days of John the Baptist. And let's find out, what was it that John the Baptist preached during that time? When he came on the scene, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, To repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At hand typically means close by, nearby, on the verge of happening, or in close proximity at the very least. The kingdom is at hand. Now you would kind of have to look at it this way. You've got in the Old Testament, Daniel and some related passages saying, a kingdom is coming, a throne is coming, God's going to put His Son upon the throne. And then you get to your New Testament, very early on what you read is, the kingdom is at hand. What kingdom would you guess they were thinking about? There's a kingdom that's now close. It's about to take place. And that's not simply once that's said, it, it keeps up. Jesus came along following John the Baptist, and it says after John was put into prison, Jesus came to Galilee and he was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. So if I understand correctly what John and Jesus are saying, they have come along and announced that that kingdom that had been predicted was about to come into existence. They were saying it is at hand. Now, you know, I would think that that alone would tell us that we're kind of now very close in our Bibles to the time period where we would expect that kingdom. From that time forward, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I guess I would ask the question, anybody that might say, Well, I don't think that kingdom's been established yet. I would ask the question, What happened? It says repeatedly, It's at hand. It's here. It's almost going to take place. Jesus said to them, I have to go preach the kingdom of God to the other cities. So this is something I'm pointing out. He preached all over the place. Because that's the reason I've been sent. I'm here to talk to you about the kingdom of God. Jesus went through every city and village and he preached and he brought the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him as he went around. And what's kind of interesting is he sent out the twelve to preach. And when we look at what they preached, Jesus called the twelve and he gave them power and authority to drive out demons, to cure diseases. And he sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So again, what's their theme? John, kingdom of God, at hand. Jesus, kingdom of God, at hand. The disciples, the kingdom of God. And again, the thought, it is close at hand. Jesus sent out the twelve. Matthew says, he commanded them, don't go in the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter the city of the Samaritans. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and you go and preach to them and say, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I don't know, you know, I don't know how you take your Bible, but when it keeps saying, in that time, in that place, in that opportunity, the kingdom was close at hand, I believe that it must have been close at hand. And that we have to take that seriously, and that he's saying it was about to be established. And we have every evidence, of course, that that came about. As a matter of fact, Jesus, Three occasions, or three scriptures, we'll put it that way, it might be an overlap of information in different gospel accounts, but he had a discussion about when the kingdom would come, okay? The at hand, pretty good pinpoints it, but here's how he said it. Now, in Matthew 16, 28, he said, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who shall not taste death, till they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. Okay? Add all of that up in your mind. People standing here right now in this place, as Jesus stood there, would see the kingdom. It was obviously within a close lifetime of these people. 
You will not taste of death till you see this kingdom. At least some. And then in Mark 9 verse 1, assuredly Jesus says, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God come or be present with power. So you're, you're going to see the kingdom. All you people right here, you'll see the kingdom come. This adds and supplements to the idea that's at hand. It's said again in Luke 9, verse 27. You'll not taste of death till you see the kingdom of God. Again, if I'm going to kind of take things literally, I'm going to have to say, while Jesus walked the earth, they expected the kingdom to come. It was about to take place. And now it was so close that we know it's within the lifetime of these people that it will come, it'll be present, they'll see it, It'll be seen by many, okay? We might ask the question, well, what, what kind of kingdom were we talking about? Uh, there's two concepts of all of this. And I don't want to go into huge detail about this, but let me just explain something. There's a concept that Jesus was coming to establish a very physical-oriented kingdom where he would rule in Jerusalem and he would be seated on the literal throne and he would command armies and they would go out and kill people and establish his rule over all mankind. And that's one concept of the kingdom. But as Jesus comes along, people are asking him about the kingdom and there are statements being made about it. And what he says about his kingdom doesn't really fit that concept. One of the things is you might think of kingdom is more like the idea of geography. You might think, well, okay, Jesus was going to establish a kingdom and, and it's going to have the borders of Israel. Maybe it'd be a little bit bigger than Israel, but it would have all these borders and you'd be able to point over there and say, you know, that's where Jesus rules over his kingdom. But Jesus said something strange in Luke 17, 20 and 21 when they asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he says the kingdom of God does not come with observation. They won't say, see here or see there. In other words, you can't point over there and say, there it is right there. Now there's the borders of it. There we could go into it. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. There's something more about the kingdom of God than simply a border or a certain geographical location. It has something to do with what's going on internally within man, men. what It is in our midst, but it's also within our hearts. The kingdom of God is not just about the rule of Christ on the face of the earth. It's about the rule of Christ in your hearts and minds. And that's what so much of it is about. While men look to geographies, well, it's all going to happen right over here. Jesus is saying, well, you really can't define it quite like that. And then there's the question connected with that. Well, is, are we to think of Jesus as a king? Oh, quite definitely. But, again, shouldn't Jesus say what his kingdom's like and what kind of king he is? It's really not our place as interpreters of the Bible to come along and say, well, what I think it ought to have been was this physical kingdom where swords were drawn and Jesus shows his power and authority over mankind and slays the enemy and, and defeat, defeated Rome back there and all that. That's the kind of king I'm looking for. Well, that's the kind of king the Jews were looking for. But you know, when Jesus went before Pontius Pilate, he was asked about his kingdom. This is about not somebody else's kingdom, not a kingdom different from what God said would be established, but about Jesus' kingdom. And... Pilate wanted to know, probably related to the trial of Jesus, he asked the question, in fact, he said, are you a king then? And Jesus' response was this, my kingdom is not of this world. Now you may say, well, that really doesn't fit the concept of that dynamic kingdom coming down and smashing all that image that we saw back in Daniel. Well, it really does if you'll stop and think about it. Because one of the things that was pointed out was that that stone that was cut out and that smote the image, it makes a big point about it and it says it was not cut out by human hands. 
It wasn't a kingdom that relates to physical force and violence upon the face of the earth. Jesus says, my kingdom's not of this world. And if, if that was the kind of kingdom he was going to establish, if his kingdom were of this world, then it would look like people sometime envision it. My servants would go out here and fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But he said, that's not where my kingdom is from. That's not what it is. That's not what I'm establishing. So if you want a definition of the kingdom, that's where you need to find it. You need to look in your Bible and you need to see what kind of kingdom. He's telling you, the, the one that's establishing his kingdom is tell us, telling you. And Pilate responds, so you are a king then. And Jesus answered, that, in other words, that's true, and you're saying it rightly. And when we come to our Bibles and start with the story of uh, Gabriel telling Mary that I will, <coughs> I, will, uh, I will give your son the throne of his father David, it is somewhat natural to think, well, he's going to be a king on a throne like David had been. But when asked that question, are you a king then? Jesus said, you're right, I am a king. That's why I was born. That's why I've come to the world. But listen to how he describes his kingdom, that I should bear witness to the truth and that everybody that's of the truth hears my voice. He just defined who his subjects are. Is he going to take a whip and a rod and a, you know, and a sword and, and go beat people into submission to become his subjects? He said, no. My subjects will be the people that will listen to me. My kingdom will be about people who will hear my voice and they'll listen to me and they'll obey me and they'll follow me. That's my kingdom. I'm not looking for a physical territory. I'm not looking for a place on the globe where I could go subtly in and say, I'm king over that region. I'm looking for hearts. I'm looking for truth to be inside of the human heart. Many people have pegged and said, well, the Bible said Jesus is going to set up there on the throne in the city of Jerusalem, and he's going to reign, and most believe he's going to reign there for a thousand years and all of that. Did the Bible really say that? The Bible said where Jesus would reign. Where was that going to be? Did the Bible in, in the New Testament, as it interpreted this, what did it say? Does that fit some of these modern theories that people have about the reign of Christ? Well, I contend this, that the Old Testament told us very plainly at the beginning where Jesus would reign. And there are other passages that go hand in hand with this. But it was found in Psalm 110. Now, Psalm 110 is a, quoted a whole bunch in the New Testament. Matter of fact, I, I may be wrong, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's the most frequently quoted prophecy of the Old Testament. And it portrayed the Lord and the Lord. And he said, the Lord said to my Lord. So you might think of that as God the Father saying to God the Son, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The reign of Jesus was always portrayed in the Bible at the throne of God. God was always saying, at my right hand. Sit at my right hand and you reign from there. That's where your enemies will be coming under your feet. Now, that's going to sound familiar. Sit at my right hand. That right hand of God, we're very familiar with that because I don't even know if anybody, if I made them right now, could quote a Bible passage or go to a Bible passage, but all of them know it's right there because it occurs so frequently. And one of the most impressive ones is at the very end of the book of Mark, the Gospel of Mark in chapter 16, verse 19. It tells us about Jesus and his death and his burial and resurrection. And then it says, So then, after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven. Okay, that's the picture we have like it in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, Jesus is ascending up into heaven. Okay? We know that. Jesus ascended to the heaven. He was received up into heaven. And what did he do? Well, Mark makes this point. He sat down at the right hand of God. Right then and there, Jesus sat at the throne of God. 
he was there as Psalm 110 verse 1 said. And you know, you just show you how frequently this comes up. It, it sounds familiar probably too because on the day of Pentecost, Peter's quoting from that passage and Peter says, you know, when we read about this one sitting at the right hand of the throne of God, he said, David said it. He himself says. But it wasn't David that ascended to the right hand of the throne of God. That's why he's telling that in Acts. That's not David on the throne. But he says, the Lord said to my Lord. See, Jesus is David's Lord. Jesus is Lord over everyone. The living and the dead. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And then he says this, therefore, let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this same Jesus that you crucified. He's now your Lord. They didn't believe that. When they hung him on the cross, they didn't believe he was their Lord. They didn't even believe he was a good teacher. But now Peter says, he's your Lord. He's the Christ. I've had several people say, of course it's not about lacking a prayer, but they're impressed when Brother Carol White at the end of his prayer says, in the name of the Christ, or in the name of Jesus the Christ, he is the Christ. This Jesus whom you crucified, he's your Christ, he's your Lord, he's your King, he's over you. The terminology of Christ, I think all of you know this, means the anointed one. He's the one that's been anointed to be prophet, priest, and king. But as we look at it here in particular, king. That's where Jesus reigns, at the right hand of the throne of God. This is after he ascended. Uh, matter of fact, Peter says, because he's up there now, he's pour, pouring forth all this we're seeing happening on the day of Pentecost. He's up there reigning, pouring forth all this that you see in here. In the Hebrews, book of Hebrews, it says in chapter 1, God has in these last days, he's talking about other generations when he spoke other ways, but in these last days he'd spoken to us by his Son, who when he had himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. What an amazing statement. It equals the statement made in the book of Mark. He has sat down at the majesty on high. He has a place of honor. Let's go back just for a moment to the book of Daniel. And I want you to portray and picture in your mind now. And don't let corruptions of our day influence you. Read it as it really says it. Okay, here is the Son of Man. He's coming with the clouds of heaven. Okay, we all know that the angel said in Acts chapter 1, He shall come again as He left. He shall come again on the clouds of heaven. And it's real easy to slip over into this business of saying, okay, that's the second coming of Christ. He's coming back and He's going to come back and that's when the kingdom's going to start. Now wait just a minute. That's not what that says. He is coming with the clouds of heaven. But we're missing the point. He went with the clouds of heaven. Who's he coming to? Is he coming down here to this earth to start a kingdom? No. It says he's coming where? To the Ancient of Days. You see, what we're seeing in this passage is Jesus has been up in heaven going back down to the earth. He's coming from the earth up to the Ancient of Days, up to, to God. Well, he gets to God, what happens? He goes up and they bring him in before God, and then he is given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is the one that will not be destroyed. Now, here's what I want you to do. Look in Ephesians. And look in Ephesians chapter 1. And look at the similarity. It's not like word for word. He's not quoting Daniel. But look at what he says. Which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Okay, what had Jesus done over here? He had ascended to the right hand of God. He'd gone up before God, the Ancient of Days. 
and, and, and brought near to Him. So God has now in the heavenly places seated Jesus, and He is far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Not only now, but in any age, any time to come, Jesus is over all. He was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that every people, nation, language should serve Him. His, even the common word in both texts is dominion, dominion, dominion. He will have dominion. He will have rule. He will have authority. And He put all things under His feet. Remember that again in Psalm 110. It says, Sit thou at my right hand until I put your enemies under the footstool of your feet. Okay, right there. He put all things under his feet. He gave him to be head over all things to the church. When we understand the Bible, we understand that the church is the established kingdom. Some people, you know, they writhe at that because it's not what they expected. Well, Jesus was not what they expected either. The kingdom here is the church here. You know, when Jesus told Peter, I will build my church and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom, that's an equation. He's just saying it a different way. He's calling it the church and the kingdom. And what we really realize is that the descriptions of the church fit the concept of the kingdom and the descriptions of the kingdom fit the concept of the church. And I'll be back around to that and show you that proof in a few minutes. What did Jesus, okay, Jesus is resurrected when we're not yet having him ascend, but what did he tell the disciples to go do? Well, for one thing, he says and starts with them by saying, now all authority has been given to me. That's just the same concept, I've been made king. I now have all authority. That's just how Ephesians 1 pictured it. That's how Daniel you know, 2 and 7 pictured it. I have now all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So you go and you make disciples of all nations and you baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. I'm your king now. I have authority over you. You go teach people. Whatever nation they're in, not just among the Jews, before he just sent them to the Jews. Now he said, you go to every nation and you tell in every nation that I have authority over you and I command you to do this and you're to be baptized in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit and, and you're going to do this to the very end of the age. In other words, you will keep doing this and, until my return. Jesus wants his disciples to do that. He, he said it a little different in Mark 16, 16, Go into all the world and preach the good news, the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. So that's what Jesus said to go teach to these disciples. What did they go teach? What did Peter, for instance, tell the Jews to do? Let all the house of Israel know assuredly God made this Jesus whom you have crucified both Lord and Christ. He has all authority and that includes over the household of Israel. And when they heard this, well, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, you need to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. In the name of Jesus Christ was the recognition of his authority. You could have gone any time and been immersed in water somewhere, but I'm telling you to do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, this is not independent of him. If you're going to be saved, you'll be saved by him. And that's where you'll receive the remission of sin and have the hope of having the Holy Spirit in your life. And the promise, this is a promise, not just to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. This command, this statement, of what they should do. Peter makes clear, he said, this is a, a command for you, and this is a command for your children, and this is a command to all the people that are far off. As many people as the Lord is going to call, which is still going on, this is their command. This doesn't represent Jews in century one back there. This is just as true today as it was then. And here we stand halfway around the world, and this is our 
gospel. This is what we preach. This is what we try to get people to see they need to do is obey those commands because they're still applicable. It's still true. With many other words, he testified and exhorted, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And to those that gladly received his word, they were baptized. And that day there were 3,000 souls added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and in prayers. And the Lord kept adding to that church, that kingdom, daily, those who were being saved. Jesus had subjects now. So, what did Philip go preach? Now this is Philip, not the apostle, but Philip the evangelist. What did Philip preach? They, in Samaria he's talking about, they believed Philip when he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God. See, we haven't forgotten the kingdom. The kingdom's still very much on the lips of everybody. He's preaching the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. And men and women, it says, were being baptized. He's preaching the kingdom. And when he preaches the kingdom, what do they do? They get baptized. He's not preaching any message different from they preached on the day of Pentecost. This is the kingdom that Jesus talked about. This is the kingdom that John talked about. This is the kingdom that God promised in the book of Daniel. What did Paul preach? Paul, we're told, went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for three months and he tried to reason with them and persuade them concerning the things of the kingdom of God. He's preaching. It's latest, the latter part of the book of Acts. He's preaching the kingdom of God. So the question kind of comes down, should we consider ourselves part of Christ's kingdom now? And and what do we find in the scripture taught about that? Look with me in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. Give thanks to the Father who qualified us to be the partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He delivered us from the power of darkness. That would be Satan's realm. And he conveyed us, some versions say, transferred us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. So... Their relationship with the Lord was they were in his kingdom. And there, the thought is, that's where we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Look, I'm just bringing that out because people kind of build up this fantasy that's largely misinterpretation of scripture, that the kingdom of this is powerful physical thing in the Bible land over there, and... Jesus has already told us, no, I'm not talking about that kind of kingdom. And this is the kingdom that's associated with our redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. I think you'd agree with me, all that last sentence there sounds very much like what we talk about the church. We're in the Lord's church, which comes about through his blood, the forgiveness of the sins, our redemption. That same truth as the kingdom. You know, in the Bible, we have several terminologies about the church. Sometimes it's the vineyard of the Lord. Sometimes it's the bride of Christ. Sometimes it's the body of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's the kingdom of Jesus Christ. All of that fits well together, I think, if you stop and think about it. Let's add another passage to that from the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, says, which sounds like what we read in Colossians, says to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he made us to be a kingdom. Not someday, he's made us to be a kingdom. And what's that kingdom about? It's about his love and the fact that by his blood he released us from our sins. It's the kingdom. It's the kingdom of his beloved son. It's the kingdom Daniel talked about. Therefore, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen Amen to that, because that's what it was saying back there in Daniel. That's what Daniel said was the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. A kingdom would arise, and when Daniel said, I saw the night visions, I saw him getting dominion and glory and honor and a kingdom forever and ever. That's what I saw, Daniel says. That's, folks, what came about. Jesus came along. John the Baptist came along. Then Jesus came along and they said, it's at hand. It's about to take place. And then 
we read about Jesus being made Lord and King. He's all over us, has all authority in heaven and on earth. You know, if tomorrow, if tomorrow Jesus came down here and said, now I'm going to have authority over there in Palestine, I'm going to set me up a kingdom about the boundary of Israel, that would be a huge step down from that. The kingdom is all of the authority. The kingdom is over everybody on this planet. The kingdom has authority over believer and unbeliever. The kingdom has authority over living and dead. His kingdom controls it all. His rule controls it all. He has absolute authority. He controls the stars. He controls the heavens. He's absolute in authority. They were made for him and they were made through him, the book of Colossians says. We need to absorb all of that and know how powerful our Lord really is. So we got, I think this is the last up there, but we might want to know, well, what happens at the end of time? Well, I believe that the thousand-year reign concept is a misinterpretation. Now, there is such a thing as a thousand-year reign talked about in the book of Revelation. Uh, you know, in the same context, it talks about chains and it talks about binding of the devil, all of which I believe, but I don't think you're ever going to take a physical chain and bind the devil and, you know, there, there are various parts we have to interpret. But I'm not trying to disagree with the revelation. But what I'm saying is, what does the Bible and plain passages say is going to happen at the end of time? Is, is that when the kingdom is going to start? No, that's when its earthly existence will come to an end. I'm not saying the kingdom will end. I'm saying its earthly part will end. And look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, now verse 24. Now what's 1 Corinthians 15 about? Anybody tell me real quick? Some of you Bible scholars out there, just one word. What's that chapter about? The resurrection. The resurrection of the dead. Whole chapter, start to finish, is about the resurrection of the dead. So in the midst of a discussion on the resurrection of the dead, the day we resurrect from the dead, that day that will come about in the midst of that discussion, he says when the end comes, Jesus will deliver the kingdom of God to the Father when he puts an end to all rule and authority and power. So when Jesus comes back to resurrect us from the dead, that will be the end of the earthly phase of the kingdom. Now, I'm gonna, I don't have scriptures up here for this, but I'm going to point real quick out. There is another sense of the kingdom. And it's sometimes called the eternal kingdom of God. And I know Peter talks about this in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. He speaks of, when he talks about, you know, adding faith and virtue and, and self-control and all those things to our lives. He talks about the idea that if, if you do this, and if you're fruitful in all of this, then an entrance into the eternal kingdom of God will be abundantly supplied to you. What, what, what is it? They're already in... This kingdom he's talking about here. So what's the eternal kingdom of God? Don't you think that's just simply heaven, as we typically think of it? That's, that's our reward. That's where we're headed. We're going to the eternal kingdom of God, where the rule of the Lord will continue. The rule and the authority of heaven will continue. It's not going to end. It's forever and ever. But the earthly phase of it will end because the earth will end. And it'll be over. I feel like when we get there, we'll feel the power of the kingdom more than we've ever felt it before. We'll drink in the knowledge that there is absolute rule. And I will say this, while on earth as king, there were challengers to his authority. There's not going to be any challengers up there. It'll be absolute in his authority. So he said when it comes to the end, Jesus will deliver the kingdom up to God the Father. And that will be the moment you know, in 1 Corinthians 15, his whole point in that specific area of that verse, he says, the last enemy, he's had fought many an enemy, Jesus has, but the last enemy is death. He will conquer death. That's the final victory. And that comes at the day of resurrection. And on that day, Jesus can hand the kingdom over and it all fits neatly together. The resurrection is the end. The earth is at the end. Now it's time to go to our home. And what a joyous day that will be. Thank God.
We have a kingdom. And it is a kingdom that cannot be shaken, as the Hebrew writer says. And we should honor God because of it. I hope those scriptures helped you. If they didn't, I'm sorry if I didn't do them good enough or explain them well enough, but I, it helps me. And it, it kind of gives you a... a kind of gives you a a, a panoramic view of the kingdom starting from Daniel coming all the way down through the ages and taking us to the very end of time when Jesus will send the kingdom home and take us home as part of that kingdom. I don't know how you feel about it. I know me, I think I know other people well enough to know one of my proudest things is to say, somebody rules me. I don't have good enough sense to rule me. I, I don't know what's best in this life, not of my own feelings and ways. I need, I need his rule. I need his authority. I, I don't consider that as any imposition on my life. I, I need it so badly for him to say, Pat Jones, this is what you need to do. This is where you need to be, and this is how you need to act. You know, we kind of, we don't like all this king business, but you remember in the days of Israel, although they were misguided, they said, give us a king. Well, I say, give us a king, but give us Jesus as our king. Forget these others. Let King Jesus reign in my heart and make him sovereign there. We're going to sing the song of encouragement. I believe we've read plenty from the book of Acts to know what they did in response. They asked Peter what they should do, and he said, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and to be, have the reception of the Spirit of God. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you. And remember he said, that's a forever promise to you, to your children, and to all us people that are so far off from the original group but we're still under that same gospel today. While we stand and sing, we'd invite you to obey that gospel. Let's be singing.